Hello, everybody. My name is Guy Browning, and I'm going to be talking about outrageous optimism, and I know we're all going to really enjoy it. <laughs> and, you know, one of the reasons I know we're going to all enjoy it is because TED audiences are always fantastic. I think they're charming, they're intelligent, and they're attractive. And uh, I would just like to prove that now. Hands up if you're sitting next to somebody charming, intelligent, and attractive. <laughs> you see? I was right to be optimistic. I really was. Now, I know we've all heard of glass half empty and glass half full, but I, uh, I like to look at things in a slightly different way. And uh, here's a brilliant cartoon by Janet Brown. It's not about half empty and half full. It's about not what I ordered. <laughs> and outrageous optimism is about having a full glass of exactly what you ordered. And I'd like to talk to you about how that worked for me and for the little village where I live. And I'd like to start by uh, sharing with you this photograph, which I had up as a child at home, and it's by Arthur Whitman from a great collection called The Family of Man. And um, I've always loved that photo because I like seeing people having a good time. Radical, I know, but just bear with me. And um, I don't know what these guys are doing. They could be at an early TED talk, or they could be watching a funny film. And, uh, I noticed that there aren't many funny films out there, which is a shame because everybody loves funny films. So I thought, I know, I'm going to make a funny film. And uh, I thought, I'm not just going to make this on my phone and put it on YouTube because that would be cautious optimism. And cautious optimists are basically pessimists having a good day. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to be outrageously optimistic. I am going to write this. I'm going to direct it, I'm going to put the whole thing on, and then not only that, I am going to premiere in Leicester Square. And as anybody who knows anything about film will tell you, that is absolute madness. But fortunately, I didn't know anything about film. <laughs> and in fact, had I known what I was doing, I wouldn't have got anywhere. But I decided the only way I was going to make this film was to get the whole village where I live to uh, make it with me. I live in a small village in Oxfordshire. We have a few houses, some nice farms, and a little stately home there in the middle. And so one evening I went out into the village and I put these posters all over the village. And they said, Brad Pitt won't be in it, but you could be. And I called a meeting at the village hall, and I thought, no one's going to turn up at all. But that village hall was absolutely packed. And I learnt, I learnt the first thing about outrageous optimism, that if you share your dream, people will come. So the village started to get to work, and we knew three things about Hollywood. We knew it's not about the art, it's about power, money, and sex. <laughs> and in Kingston Bagpews in Oxfordshire, we don't have any of those. <laughs> We don't have any of those, so the only way we were going to get them was by asking. So we started asking, and the first thing we needed was power. Now, the power in Kingston Bagpews is the parish council. They decide what happens in the village and what doesn't happen. So we asked the parish council, here they are, <laughs> practicing for the village fate. So obviously, they were the right kind of people. They said yes immediately. And I thought, well, this asking people in power works, so I'll move up the food chain and I'll ask our MP. And uh, this is him shortly after I asked him. <laughs> and I said, um, <clears throat> we're making the film in the village with 2,000 of your voters. Would you like to help? <laughs> and funny enough, he did, and his name is Ed. And I learned something also about asking people. First of all, people in power are just people like us, normal people with slightly bigger offices. And, most importantly, people in power are often as surprised as you are that they're in power. <laughs> yes. So don't ever hesitate to ask them anything. So we had the power, and uh, then, we needed, then we needed the money. And uh, so we asked people we knew, and they asked people they knew. We unleashed the power of social media, which in Kingston Bagpews me means putting a little note up in the bus stop. And uh, we, raised, we raised the money. We didn't raise a huge amount of money, but we raised enough. But what was really important is the money we didn't spend. And the money we didn't spend was on two things. It was on uh, accommodation and hotels, and it was on catering. 
because they, they cost a fortune in making a film. And instead, I went to the Women's Institute, and um, here they are, and uh, I said, would you mind doing the catering for the film? And they said, yes, of course, we'll do a few scones and we'll use the big teapot. <laughs> and they turned out, in the end, they catered for up to 60 people three times a day for six weeks. And that is a hell of a teapot. <laughs> And the most wonderful thing was a woman came to me, she's not on that photo, and she said, Guy, I know nothing about film, but I do know about making fairy cakes. I'm going to make you a thousand fairy cakes. And that's what she did. And um, here they are. <laughs> <laughs> and then we didn't spend any money on hotels either because all the professional cast and crew, they stayed with people in the village. And that worked really well. In fact, some of them are still there. Haven't got rid of them yet. So we had, uh, we had the money, we had the power, and the last thing we needed was the sex. We wanted to do a romantic comedy, so we needed somebody good-looking. And sadly, there are no good-looking people in Kingston Bagpews, <laughs> apart from the Women's Institute, obviously. <laughs> Just making that clear. But I had a friend, I had a friend, and he said he knew a very good-looking guy who lived in London. I thought, well, if he lives in London, he must be attractive. <laughs> And uh, here he is, and he's a very Tom Mitchelson, great-looking guy. And I had uh, I had um, lunch with him, and I said, "Would you like to be the star in our film?" And he said, "Yes, immediately." And he told me afterwards he just wanted to get out of the restaurant as quickly as possible, <laughs> because there's a very fine line be between being an outrageous optimist and be being a crazed fantasist. <laughs> but the other lesson there is that when you're outrageously optimistic, people often say yes, because they don't believe anything's ever going to happen. <laughs> and when it does, it's too late. So, <laughs> so we had the money, we had the, uh, we had the power, and we had the uh, good-looking uh, car. So then we started to make the film. And six weeks, the whole village worked together. And uh, when a whole community works together and everyone knows each other, that changes a community forever. So we made our film. Everybody went home, and uh, I sat down to edit the whole thing together. And uh, the good news was, it was in focus. <laughs> the bad news was, it was four hours long, it wasn't funny, didn't make any sense. <laughs> didn't make any sense at all. So we knew the critics would love it. <laughs> but obviously we didn't, it was our film, and I promised the whole village that we were going to Leicester Square, and I'd just given them a big mess that wasn't going anywhere. And it was about this time when I stopped going out into the village during daylight hours. <laughs> but the thing about outrageous optimism is it works best when things are at their bleakest. And I didn't know how we were going to move forward, but I was sure that the universe would provide some way of moving forward. And what the universe provided was a woman, a woman, very special woman called Beverly Mills. And she'd seen this four-hour epic, and she said to me, Guy... You've got a good film in there, but that's not it. <laughs> and I listened to her very, very carefully because she was and is a BAFTA award-winning editor, and she re-edited our entire film for nothing between Hollywood epics, and I didn't even have to ask her. And uh, the wonderful thing was she gave us this fantastic 90-minute film called Tortoise in Love. The only downside was that half my friends, neighbours and relatives were now on the cutting room floor. So I had two options. One, I could emigrate to Canada, or we could have outtakes that were twice as long as the film. <laughs> and obviously, that's what we went for. So we had the film. We had the film, and then uh, for the first time, I went to Leicester Square by myself. I looked around Leicester Square, and uh, I noticed that they were rebuilding it for the Olympics. So right then and there, in Leicester Square, I got my phone out, and I phoned Westminster Council. And a miracle happened. They answered the phone. <laughs> they answered the phone and I said, look, you're rebuilding the square, you're going to need to reopen it, you need to celebrate the reopening it. You don't want some tired old Batman, Superman premiere with A-list celebrities clogging up the red carpet. What you want is 2,000 yokels driving their tractors into Leicester Square to see a film that they've made themselves. And they said, we'll think about it. <laughs> And they thought about it for three months in total silence. <laughs> and then something truly wonderful happened, is that our friendly MP, Ed, was made Minister for Film. <laughs> you won't believe the strings I had to pull to get him that one. 
And of course, then uh, things got a little bit easier. But they, Ed was really helpful. It wasn't just Ed. It was because people could see that a dream was about to come true. And when that happens, everybody is prepared to help. So we got our film to Leicester Square. We took the village all the way to Leicester Square. And uh, here's my friend, the dairy farmer, who drove his tractor into Leicester Square, onto the red carpet, with a matching tractor. <laughs> now, that is A-list behaviour. And here's the picture that makes me really, really happy. Is this is our village in the cinema in Leicester Square. And as you'll see, it's very, very much like the uh, first photo I showed you. And what makes me really happy is there's a lady in the back of that photograph, and she wrote to me afterwards, and she said, Guy, until the premiere, I'd never, ever been to London, and now you've ruined it for me. <laughs> because every time I go to London, I will expect a red carpet. <laughs> and I learned two things about outrageous optimism in that whole project. The first thing I learned was the absolute power of asking people and that I firmly believe that everybody has a big yes inside them that's just waiting to get out. And the second thing I learned with outrageous optimism is you can't do everything yourself, but that if you roll the red carpet out for other people, they'll roll the red carpet out for you. That's outrageous optimism. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.